So welcome to the pre-recording of lecture 38 in a course on supercomputing. So the title of this topic is Big Data Computing, which is in a way not strictly part of supercomputing. And I will also try to sketch the relationship with supercomputing. Although one could ask the question, now at the end of a course on supercomputing, and suppose that you have a lot of computing power available, what are you going to compute now? Um, so I will give two examples. In a way, uh, this lecture consists in two parts. Uh, if you are a problem solver, I will explain the pancake sorting problem and then also the word count problem. Uh, but since this is also kind of a practical course, I will talk about two software systems. And uh, there are the technical terminologies that uh, arise when uh, talking about uh, problems solved on a computer. Okay, so what's the problem? Uh, well, a lot of problems are actually memory bound and random access memory is not large enough. Um, so even though the topics, uh, this lecture was designed 15 years ago, so even though these topics, the specifics might be a little bit dated, there is never enough disk space, there is never enough computing power. So um, we are processing large volumes of data and then uh, also, you can have data, so in the first part, the data will be computed, will be generated. Uh, in the second part of this lecture, we will look at actual uh, processing of data. So the first part uh, consists of an application belonging to computational group theory. So in a way, we will go to the beautiful uh, fantasy world of pure mathematics. Um, so, but here is the technical problem. So we have, uh, we actually have a lot of data and in order to process it, it needs to get into the random access memory. So the idea of the software Rumi is uh, to treat the disk as uh, random access memory. Sounds like a very straightforward and actually a naive idea at first, but uh, it makes sense with parallelism in mind. So in some sense, this is also a course to introduce ideas from parallel computing. Here is an application. So there is the puzzle, the Rubik's Cube, which I will not discuss here, uh, but one application and in some sense the goal of the course is also that you find your way to the literature that in some sense, as I'm talking here, that you look at uh, the literature. So there is the, the, the Rubik's Cube and as far as a complexity uh, measure goes, what is actually now the minimal number of moves you need uh, to solve any given Rubik's Cube? Okay, uh, so the disk is the new RAM. Um, well, this is not going to work. Uh, first of all, disks are way too slow. Uh, so here are some historical bandwidths. Uh, so it's 50 times less than RAM. Uh, so in this course, we actually considered RAM already as pretty slow. And one motivation for GPU computing was just an increased bandwidth. Um, so with GPUs, we expressed also bandwidth already in terms of terabytes per second. Uh, these are historical times, however. Um, so the, the, the times, uh, the, the, the absolute numbers will no longer match, but it's still safe to say that uh, it's still the bandwidth of a disk. Uh, the amount of data you can get from and to a disk is at least uh, several magnitudes slower than can you retrieve from random access memory. Solution. Parallelism. So use the disks in parallel. Um, fine, that's one solution. However, the waiting time of a disk is actually still also quite bad. Um, 
you can use streaming, which involves the use of efficient caches. Um, so I will not go into the technical details. Uh, let's go to an example, um, a motivating example for this. Uh, the Rubik's Cube is in itself already a good example, but I can uh, illustrate the uh, problem with the problem of pancake sorting. So imagine a restaurant setting. So uh, the cook comes up with pancakes, uh, dumps them all onto a plate. The waiter has to serve uh, this pile of pancakes. And it, if the pancakes are just dumped on the plate, it's actually not really so presentable. So the problem is to nicely sort uh, the pile of pancakes so that the largest pancake is at the bottom and the smallest pancake is at the top. So to turn this into a numerical problem, we are going to label every pancake with a number. The number corresponds to the size. So the first pancake is the smallest one. The pancake with the largest number or the largest pancake is represented by the largest number. So here we have a stack of four pancakes, one, two, three, four, um, and we have a spatula. So uh, the sorting is uh, not like it, we are going to sort numbers, but there are only certain moves that we can make. Um, so we can look at this pile and here we see that uh, the largest uh, pancake is the second one. So we move uh, our spatula under this uh, four and we flip uh, the pile. So then actually four is on top. But actually if we then in the next move, uh, so there are eight piles, the piles should be seen in pairs. And in red, you see the spatula. So in the second move, you put your spatula all the way at the bottom and then you flip the entire pile. And then the largest pancake lies at the bottom. Okay, two moves. In the third move, uh, we place our spatula under two and we flip the whole pile. Two becomes on top. And then in the last move, we place the spatula under the second pancake in the pile. And that's the smallest one here. And that pancake then appears on top. Okay. Four moves were sufficient to sort a pile of four pancakes. Um, if you have studied computer science, you know that this is really great because you would expect n log n, um, which would be here uh, almost twice uh, as, as the log of four is two. Um, so the question is, uh, and this could have applications in the pancake serving business. Uh, so how many flips are actually sufficient to sort? Okay, it turns out that there are papers written about uh, this problem. Um, look at the Wikipedia page, for example. Uh, but I hope to explain how to tackle this problem in a computational way. So there's still open problems there. So it's not n log n. Uh, it's closer to linear uh, time, uh, constant times the size of the pile. How should you think about this problem or how are we going to think about this in a big data sense? And here you see how the big data comes in. So look at this graph. Uh, we have one, two, three, four. So that's the sorted uh, pile of pancakes. And then we have the three possible moves. Uh, so we can put our spatula under the four and completely flip the pile. So that is going from one, two, three, four two, four, two, three, two, one, or we could place our spatula under the two. So the K equals two. So then the one and the two are flipped. And the third move is that we can place our spatula under the three. And then we have three, two, one, four. So these three, perm three configurations are the configuration in which you only need one flip. So uh, in the 24, so the 4 factorial, we have 1 plus 3. Uh, so we are going to decompose 
four factorial, so there are the 24 possible permutations. And here with this graph, I indicated the beginning of the graph. I did not draw the entire graph, but I hope it's clear that the farther you are from the 1, 2, 3, 4, the more uh, flips that are needed. Um, so, and it should also clear how you can answer the question for any given number. Uh, you can answer the question by actually constructing that pancake sorting graph and uh, simply then counting how far you are from the one to three up to your number of pancakes. So this is a computational approach to answer this question. Uh, if you actually do the computation, you will actually also see the optimal uh, algorithm to actually sort your pancakes. And you will also have actually seen that also, inter also gives you a lot of insight in the complexity. Now, the 24 is still a modest number. Now, factorials, they grow extremely, extremely fast. So this is an example where you start out with a small natural number, an innocent looking number, and you generate lots and lots of numbers. Because to represent this graph, and also I will not go in details of this, uh, it is not a trivial problem to set up. But there is software, and here is a run of the software. Software that I ran <coughs> more than 10 years ago. The link is still available. I did not rerun this, uh, and also the three minutes might be a little bit dated, so uh, the disks should be faster these days. Um, so this could be, uh, although this is a very nice exercise to rerun it. So you see with 11 a pancake, and uh, this is bread first search, so this is also uh, an applied uh, graph theory computation. So you see that the software Rumi will construct the entire graph, and uh, it gives you the answer of the problem. You can actually reconstruct, so there are 13 levels. At level 0, that's only one element, that's the sorted sequence. At level 13, these are the six uh, configurations that are actually hardest to sort. But you can also look at this a little bit more as a statistician, as a histogram. Uh, you can see these numbers as histograms. Uh, you see that uh, at level 10, actually, you have the bulk. Uh, so you have 1,425,000 actually 14 uh, million uh, elements there. Um, so you could see that as the, you could see that still there are, it's not exactly uh, 13. So for the 11 pancake problem, it's not exactly 11 ones. So there are about 1 million configurations that will require more than 11 moves over this total 11 factorial problem. This was done MPI, uh, so this is an application of MPI as well. In some sense, it perfectly fits in this course. Uh, this is a high level application, but in this course, we are not actually uh, scared or, or worried to use MPI. Um, so, and instead of uh, doing a matrix matrix multiplication or other interesting linear algebra basic primitives we are solving a sorting problem and looking at it at a very global way so here is uh, the result so there is the 11 factorial 39 million and uh, you have the of the 39 million 14 million configurations actually do require uh, 10 moves. Uh, with 11 moves, you will have all of them, except a little bit less than 1 million. So not bad. Uh, running this software for 3 minutes, and that is an illustrative example, uh, running this software for 3 minutes, that was done in 2012, gives you actually a nice uh, first cut on this problem. 
All right, I will say something more about Rumi. Uh, so Rumi is an open source uh, C and C++ library. It's publicly available at the SourceForge link, uh, written by the PhD student Daniel Kunkel of the lab of Gene Cooperman. Um, in the literature, you can see the application of Rubik's Cube. So there is the uh, study of these puzzles. Um, so there is the so-called God number. Um, imagine a super being, uh, immensely powerful and smart. Uh, how, in how many moves would that uh, super being need to solve Rubik's Cube? Um, the point of Rumi, and um, um, the point is that it's actually extending a uh, very familiar and very commonly used uh, computer language with actually uh, high-level uh, disk-based disk parallelism. Um, and it is based also on the standard, still standard, uh, of passage passing. And this is a application in computational group theory. So this is an application to, one could say, an area of pure mathematics. If you are interested in doing theoretical investigations of this kind, then running the software could give you a lot of insight. Okay, uh, so what is the point here? Um, so if you have uh, a cluster, uh, 50 nodes, uh, 200 gigabyte disk space, you could think about a computer lab uh, that at that time uh, you would have a computer lab with some disks not that heavily used sometimes. So uh, you get uh, storage of, if you multiply the 50 times 200, you get 10 terabytes. Uh, using the uh, disks in parallel, uh, so the uh, 5 gigabyte per sec second uh, is the multiplication of the bandwidth of one disk to a more respectable uh, level. Um, I mentioned cache, uh, so uh, you have to now consider the RAM as cache. Um, we have in this course also discussed network topologies. Uh, so uh, the, if the, the computers in the network are, for example, organized in a ring, and if the, uh, so you should have at least a hypercube that accesses, allows every computer to have access into a logarithmic, logarithmic in the number of computers, which is in a 50 node cluster kind of constant. So the, the benefit of this application is that it allows to apply several concepts of parallel distributed memory computing, what we have considered in this course. All right. Um, here is some details on the Rumi programming uh, model. Uh, so what does it provide? It provides uh, data structures. Uh, so in, in some sense, uh, this could become also part of a data structures course. Uh, so you could, uh, if you have the basic data structures well provided, uh, then um, as a programming exercise, as a good Rumi is a good example of a, of a very successful, highly successful uh, programming job being done. Um, in previous runs of the course, I did have uh, actual programming examples. Um, I've decided in this run to skip this. Um, and at the end here, so this is the end of this first part, I will uh, mention the relative, uh, the, the relevant references. Um, so there is the communications of the ACM um, and also in the Journal of Symbolic Computation. So computational group theory belongs to, has significant overlap with, journal, with symbolic computation. In some sense this is a great example also of an application that 
of symbolic competition that is of widespread uh, importance outside the area. Okay, um, now let's switch gears. I'm kind of halfway into this lecture. We looked at the pancake uh, sorting problem, so now we are looking into the word count problem, which is essentially simply a frequency table. Uh, but we're going to see this problem from, uh, again now, a very big um, data perspective. Okay, um, I prepared this also 15 years ago uh, and have not made uh, too much, too many adjustments to the slides. Um, however, uh, this is a good example of actual data. So we are still uh, living in the big data um, revolution. So, um, and you want to apply some computations to this. Um, so in, in a way, this also fits within uh, supercomputing. So we have large problems. Uh, but this problem is actually not solved by supercomputing. Uh, it is solved by cloud computing. So the MapReduce programming model is a great example of cloud computing. Um, so the purpose and it's also a high level, it's an application. So uh, the uh, user has to be comfortable with Java, a language that's routinely taught as a first programming language, and must be familiar with the Unix command line interface uh, terminal. All right, um, so here is uh, the meaning of this. Um, so we have recommender systems for movies. Um, now you can only solve these problems if uh, you have, you can solve these problems only if you have large data sets. Uh, the alternative is just ask your friends and relatives if you need a recommendation for a movie. But then often it depends uh, how well you know the friends and relatives. Uh, sometimes what they like a particular movie is already uh, a, a hint that you shouldn't like it. But so the with big data, if you have sufficient large data sets of movie preferences, then you can classify and uh, solve this problem uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so, um, there are the big data uh, tools, and actually the bottom line of the slides is, has been also a little bit the bottom line of this course. Um, it's no longer, uh, you no longer need uh, to be part of a large corporation or government agency to actually use this. Uh, so throughout this course, we mentioned personal supercomputing. And this is also uh, the point that this actually makes um, all right, uh, so here is the context. Uh, the context in this course is supercomputing. Um, so if you have large problems, you can get a supercomputer. We define a supercomputer as uh, something that is at the top of its capabilities, significantly uh, more capable than any other computer. So in the traditional sense, we have the top 500 of um, computers. Now, this is actually doing the same thing, uh, the same software, but then on larger and larger computers. And in some sense, this is not something that uh, strictly works. Uh, so as if there's one thing that also is clear of this course, that if you want to solve large problem, large computational problems, you must also adjust your programming principles. Um, we, in the first part of the course, um, in the first part of this lecture, I had a cluster, 50 node cluster. So that's the scale out um, 
the scale out uh, approach. So these are two uh, limiting factors. Um, the cloud computing way is actually the third way uh, that deals with scaling problems. Okay, um, here uh, are all the big words. Um, so you have uh, smart software, dumb hardware. Um, so that's, you could, if you have to organize these principles. So you could kind of uh, uh, look straight in the middle. Um, so you have to be smart, um, expect failure. Uh, the bottom line is also extremely important. Build applications, uh, not infrastructure. Um, data moving is extremely expensive. Uh, so in the later lecture, I hope to explain communication avoiding linear algebra operations. Uh, so avoid moving data. Instead, uh, move the operations to the data, move processing to the data. Um, so um, make sure that uh, cloud computing is actually scaling out, is actually the standard in big data processing. Okay. Um, Hadoop, what is Hadoop? Uh, so it's actually a uh, meaningless name, uh, a toy's name. Uh, so here is giving some credit. Uh, so there is the uh, Google technology. Um, so there are two parts. So there is the file system and then there is the map reduce. Uh, so hardware and software. So map reduce is the guiding principle uh, behind the software Hadoop. Okay, uh, here is another. So I have actually many slides, but many slides are kind of repetitive. So in a way, uh, this uh, style of uh, presenting is a little bit a switch from the uh, condensed uh, mathematical content as with the pancake sorting. Uh, there is the binary um, organization of Hadoop. So you have to have uh, support uh, from the file system. So there is a, a distributed file system. So we are actually doing cluster computing. Uh, and um, in some sense, there is the Rumi software, which is a small scale project. Here we have uh, the uh, Google supported uh, large uh, data cluster. Um, large data set, uh, data sets distributed among a cluster. So there is the hardware and then there is the software, the data processing paradigm MapReduce, uh, which is, as it is, it does two things. Uh, again, in two, to keep it uh, simple and organized, we have an input map and an output reduction. So, uh, to make it all work, uh, there is the tight integration of the software onto the hardware. Uh, so in some sense, what I mentioned also earlier, if you scale up also to a supercomputer, your software needs to be attuned to the hardware. Okay. Um, it runs on commodity uh, clusters and uh, it does not make actually very big assumptions on the computers. Uh, so in some sense, computers have much longer lifespan these days. Uh, so we are actually not requiring that much of the infrastructure. We are assuming dumb hardware and expecting failures. So uh, it's also a layer, it's an application. So we are looking for providing uh, we are solving problems, so looking, building, looking to build applications. <coughs> Here is the um, hardware, of which I don't really know that much. Um, so the blocks in the hard in the files is uh, stored at megabytes, uh, larger blocks, um, which kind of is not like uh, typical file systems, which lose use smaller blocks. Um, the hardware is the Hadoop distributed file system, uh, which is actually not hardware, it's system software, 
uh, to be proper. Um, it's actually optimized for uh, reading uh, lots of data. So data is organized in blocks and also kind of robust enough to uh, tolerate the expected failures. Okay, um, mapping and reducing. So if you have ever uh, worked with Python, uh, you could uh, work with lists and map and reduce. And uh, this comes from a very functional programming tool. Uh, so one can organize one's programs um, one can actually see a program as a sequence of data transformations. Uh, so in, in a way, the functional programming paradigm that is available in any language these days um, can be applied here. So in some sense, it is also a programming model, but one that is uh, very common. Okay, so uh, it's a functional programming model and how it gets executed is then the task of the software. Okay, the whole point here is that um, it's a way uh, to deal with large data sets, but then in a way that is completely transparent to the user. Uh, so the user actually is so this is cloud computing so unlike uh, you can actually go to the data on your disk uh, where the data is and how it is managed is actually not the responsibility of the user so what the user needs to do is to figure out how the problem is best uh, rewritten or broken up or formulated in this chains of map and reduce functions and then the parallelism is then uh, applied uh, by the uh, divide and conquer uh, principles. Okay, uh, here is another slide, uh, a lot of repetition here. Um, um, perhaps a little bit of uh, how the uh, manager worker uh, paradigm could also be uh, applied here. Um, when we introduced MPI, we had the common world, and the common world could actually also be organized in a hierarchy. Uh, we never took advantage of this, uh, but this is here a setting in which your clusters could be organized into uh, groups of smaller groups of clusters. Um, and one can think of, again, at these hierarchies, which then allow for a hypercube arrangement uh, that going from any node to any other node could still be arranged uh, in a logarithmic cost in the total number of nodes. Um, all right, um, here is a picture of the two layers. Um, and also a little bit the terminology um, between uh, the clusters. Um, so this is a most likely an outdated uh, copy of a picture. Um, at the, there is a strict uh, division here of what uh, the management of the data does and then also what the application does the map reduce layer. Okay, uh, there are some restrictions here. Uh, so this is for batch processing, so running servers at night, uh, not for real-time uh, queries. Um, so uh, an application is uh, web crawlers. Um, so the information of the uh, that is provided by the web crawlers is actually processed and batched by these map processes. 
All right, uh, here is the definition then of uh, cloud computing. Um, so this is now quite a common uh, model. Uh, you don't actually need any, take any responsibility of running your own computers and managing and maintaining them. All you need is a credit card. Uh, so this is the third way. Instead of buying access to a supercomputer, instead of managing your own cluster computers, uh, it's actually the providers of the cloud computing that will deal with the scaling problems that are associated with scale up and scale out. So you can focus on your application and put all the smarts in there. Um, okay. Cloud computing, when I pre prepared this first, was still new. So this is why there are so many types of slides. Um, so here is uh, the working of uh, cloud computing. Um, there is uh, the service of on demand. So you can begin small and then gradually uh, scale up. And uh, the entire costs that are associated by having to need uh, more and more infrastructure can be um, the complexities of that can be uh, the responsibility of the cloud provider. Okay, uh, so this is the Amazon Web Services. So there is the data server and the cloud computing server. Uh, so, um, and there is also the MapReduce, which functions in the uh, cloud. Okay, so uh, time for a problem. So there is the um, word count problem, which anybody can solve if you have uh, from an introductory programming uh, course perspective. So think about being a building a frequency table of words. And uh, this can be solved by a data structure. Uh, this data structure is actually uh, building up a frequency table. In the map reduce language, uh, this consists of two steps. Uh, so we have the input, uh, the map, uh, the key and the value pairs. Um, so the keys could be the words, the values, the number of times each word occurs. And then you want to reduce this um, in the second step. Uh, the, all the list of the values, um, you will reduce them to another key value pair. Let's try to make this very concrete here. So this is called the Hello World problem of Hadoop. Um, so the input is um, one text, uh, and then the output is the frequency of words. Um, so in an introductory programming course, you can take uh, any free book. Uh, so imagine, so I don't know, who, I still read books, but uh, so imagine that you had to do this by hand. So really scanning uh, all the pages. Uh, uh, now, any book can be processed, the words can be counted extremely fast. Uh, with the project Gutenberg, you have all the classics there and uh, available uh, for scanning in plain text. Um, imagine that you have to do this for all the books within a certain particular discipline and you want to analyze uh, the terminology. So what are the most frequently occurring words. Uh, so in this course we mentioned the encyclopedia of parallel programming. Uh, imagine that you could make uh, such an encyclopedia from scanning the entire literature in parallel and distributed computing. Um, and also then the word count problem would be uh, most likely be uh, one entry point how you would need to uh, the most frequently occurring words, you should have good definitions of this. Okay, so uh, here is the solution of the world com problem with MapReduce. And again, this is a very high level. I do not have actual experience with MapReduce. Um, so I try to explain uh, the 
programming model. So we have the unique keys. Um, so any word is unique in its sense. Uh, the values that are occurring is not. Um, uh, so um, it sounds very basic, uh, but in a very elementary programming course, we actually don't really distinguish between lower and case, uh, uppercase words. If you see, for example, words, uh, words uh, with here the last uh, symbol on the slide is the question mark. So one needs to be careful also to strip away uh, these punctuation symbols. Uh, so there is also the comma after the key. So, and the key here occurs also here uh, with the key. Um, so if you look at this text as the slide, so the word key occurs many times, but in the plural form. So that's another um, possibility. Do you uh, distinguish between keys and key? Um, for verbs, it might be even more uh, more interesting. So this is here a little bit where there is an overlap with uh, natural language processing that requires some care about um, processing this. Here is then uh, the map reduce uh, problem. So we have uh, the uh, input, which is um, a line of text. Um, so we have a line number in the text, uh, which is unique, and the text on the line. Then we have uh, the map, the, which breaks it up into words. Uh, so here, there is already not the non-trivial problem that we considered with the plurals of each word. And uh, if you consider verbs as different, if you want to separate that as well. Um, then there is the counting, so which will be done by the reduce, so the counting of the words. Now this is done here for one text. I imagine that this is done for multiple texts. Um, so here is the uh, Java syntax. So uh, for people familiar with uh, C++, it is uh, related, uh, so the related uh, terminology, uh, also the semicolon. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is pseudocode. Uh, pseudocode using uh, some of the syntax that you might encounter with Java. All right, uh, so there are more examples uh, that are available. I mentioned web crawlers. Uh, so you have the processing of web pages. Uh, so this is another application. There is the entire graph uh, that, so not only now, so we started with graph with the sorting. Here, of course, if you want to have a model of the entire World Wide Web, that is a huge graph. Um, so you may want to, uh, so you have there your big data set already, where to look for. Um, here are the problems uh, that are solved uh, in this map reduce uh, terminology. Uh, building this large um, graph that represents uh, the internet. Um, and there actually you want to see, you want to find the mapping of the words that occur on any particular website. There is the building of the index. Um, so you want to check, of course. So this is a little bit how uh, the input is prepared for queries in search engines. Uh, you want to see if uh, which are the most relevant documents that uh, describe any given word or phrase. And that then uh, provides the URLs of where to look for. Sorting uh, is another application. So um, 
occurs very frequently. Uh, we mentioned distributed sorting uh, algorithms in this course. Here is also how you could phrase or frame uh, the distributed sorting within the map reduce uh, functionality. All right, uh, so this was a very uh, shallow introduction or perhaps not, uh, if it's useful to you. Um, in, to an introduction to an area of big data computing or cloud computing as well, which is uh, very much related to supercomputing and which can be considered as an application in this last part of the course. To illustrate some of the concepts and the technologies that we discussed.